Hey, this is Levi, and I want to thank you so much for joining us for this message from Fresh Life Church. It's summertime, and we know you're hitting that hammock, you're out in the canoe, you're lying by the lake, and you're jumping on that airplane for that last minute trip. And one of the things you got to figure out is what book are you going to throw in that beach bag? What book are you going to bring with you? Well, we're here to help because we've picked some amazing books and invited the authors to come out to Fresh Life and to speak, giving us kind of a, a book report on the message that lit them up so much that they needed to write this book out. And uh, so I hope you'll enjoy this message from a few of my friends speaking, uh, helping us figure out our summer reading. What a privilege to be a part of these services all across the weekend at Fresh Life. You guys can have a seat and um, just look at somebody and say, isn't it good to be in church? Just kind of tell your neighbor, is it, wasn't it worth it getting to church this weekend? And man, what a privilege for Shelly and me. We came from Atlanta, Georgia to be a part of Fresh Life this weekend and all of its services uh, across uh, all this upper Midwest. And uh, what a privilege for us. And I just want to always honor our friends and say thank you to Pastor Levi and Jenny for welcoming us again into our Fresh Life family. And I just believe in celebrating vision and what God does through people. And I am so excited. Uh, why Watching Fresh Life as it moves on into the purposes and into the vision and into the destiny that God has for this church and to see what God has done and what he is doing and to believe him for what he is going to do in the future. And that's because of Pastor Levi and Jenny and their willingness to come and believe God for something that wasn't, to plan into something that they couldn't see, to believe for something that, you know, in time was like a dream. But yet now we're standing in that dream. All of us today are sitting in the beauty of what God is doing. And it's just such a great privilege for us. We love you guys. Shelly and I love you. We love your family. We count your friendship is one of the most dear friendships to us in the world. Your family is incredible, and we love every single one of you, and it's a privilege to be uh, at Fresh Life again. I'm telling you, when Pastor Levi calls me and says, will you come and preach? I'm like, man, how soon can we get on a plane? Yes, we want to be a part of that. And to be a part of this summer reading series, especially coming at the end of it, and man, those big words earlier in the introduction, Levi, because man, I know how incredible these last few weeks have been. And I'm like, okay, that's a high bar. But I really believe in this message. And I wrote the book, Not Forsaken, because I wanted to help all of us see God as a perfect Father. That's what this message is really all about. It's about a transformation that happens in our lives when we come to see the Almighty God as a perfect Father. And something so crazy happened to me. I know I'm not supposed to say that if I don't tell you what, but I don't have time to tell you the story, but it's in the book. But something so crazy happened to me at the last few steps of finishing this book. I wrote on this book all through uh, the year last year, and in December, days away from turning in the manuscript for the very last time, God dropped an envelope, a letter out of heaven into my life. And it was the biggest confirmation that this is the right message at the right time. It's God's time for this message to land into people's lives. And when we came today, I was praying and believing that all across this weekend and in the weeks that follow as the message goes out in online church and on all the online platforms, that someone's life is going to be transformed today. This is not about just a message for a weekend. It's not just about a lot of us and a lot of different locations linked together today. This is for you today. This is God wanting you to know today that he sees you, that he loves you, that he has a plan for you. And what is in the past, that's real, but it won't stop God from doing in the present what he wants to do to move you into the future that he is dreaming about for your life. And so, Father, I thank you today that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. You know all the hurt and all the struggle and all the pain and the frustration of our past. You know all the challenge that we're facing today. But that's not where your story ends for any of us. Your story is leading us into the future. And not a future dominated by fear, but a future that has written over it. This is my daughter. This is my son. This is my loved daughter, my loved son. And I have plans for their lives that no one can thwart. 
So I pray that you would break the curse that the enemy has tried to put on every life and that you will release into all of our hearts today a revolutionary message, a revival message of believing again today that I am and we are who you say I am. And I can be everything that you're dreaming about for my life. And I thank you for that. And I believe you're going to do it right now. And if you believe that, can you just maybe in your heart just say, I believe that today. I believe God can change my life, even in this moment today. And I believe it's going to happen. And I'm thanking God for it. You know, A.W. Tozer said that uh, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Think about how stunning that one statement is. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And he follows that with this quote. He said, it's because we tend by secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. The reason we do that is because we're created. We are not self-sustaining and we didn't arrive into this story by ourselves. We're created by God, put in motion by God. We are here because of God. And that means there's an internal responsive mechanism inside of every one of our hearts that's longing for, searching for, looking for, reaching for, if you will, the God who made us. And so whatever you think that God looks like is the most important thing about you because you're moving toward that God. I'll give you a few illustrations. If you think that God is grandpa in the sky, so he's like uh, got the miracle ear and he's a, a gentle old loving man, maybe got some candy in one of his pockets for the kids, but he has to have the text on his phone in that super large font that you could read from down the street. He doesn't know how to work a remote control, would never know how to get online and do anything. And he's not really relevant to your world right now then you're going to have a soft spot in your heart for God, but you're not going to believe that he can make a difference in a real world moment for you. You may think he's this angry man upstairs. And if that's the way you see God, someone who wants to squash you or crush you, just waiting for the moment to obliterate you, then here's how you're responding for God. You're trying to get as far away from him as possible. And maybe the reason you haven't been in church is because you thought, as soon as I get to church, I'm getting closer to the God who wants to smash my life. You see, however we view God is important because we're moving toward that concept. Maybe for you, it's Alexa or Siri, and if you need directions, or you can't remember something, or you need a helping hand, you're like, okay, God, can you do A, B, or C for me? But as soon as God does or doesn't answer in the right way, we just move on with our lives until we need God again. I dare say a lot of people think I believe in God, but this impersonal force, light, energy, the har harmonic convergence of the universe, this divine vibration that's out there somewhere that I'm trying to get in tune with. We all have some kind of image of God, but here's the beauty of it today. God isn't silent in this process. He's not sitting back watching you and saying, man, I hope you get it right because it's really, really important. I hope you figure it out because it's like the most important thing about your life. No, God has been in the equation the whole time saying, I want you to know who I am. I want you to understand who I really am. You look up in the night sky and you know this God is amazing and powerful and creative. The stars are singing his praise and telling his glory. So much so that his word says everywhere on planet earth, people know there's a God. How? Because he has a billboard called the universe and you can see it from everywhere you are on this planet. But he didn't stop there. He started moving through time, culminating in the coming of Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, God in human flesh, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen, do you know this verse? You've seen the father. And then Jesus begins to show us in his modeling, his relationship with God, and in his teaching who God is. And the beautiful thing about it, he taught us something more than everything else about God.
He did teach us that he's a creator, a sustainer, a Lord, a master, that he's just, that he's almighty, that he's infinite, that he's sovereign. Jesus taught us all of those things, but he taught us something more than everything else. He taught us that God is a father. 189 times in the four gospels alone, Jesus shows us that God is the father. And in the most important moments, it seems like this comes into view. Think about the Lord's prayer. I want to dare say that almost all of us can get the first line. Let's try together. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Are you ready? Our father. Everybody knew it. (laughs) Our father. Do you know the rest? who art in heaven, hallowed be, you need, almost need to say thy, <laughs> thy name. So what is he doing? He's saying, I want you to know that this God who is infinite, this God who is sovereign, this God who is a creator, this God who is just and all-knowing and all-powerful, who is Lord and King, this is a God you can intimately know as a father. How do you put your arms around sovereign? How do you put your arms around infinite? You can't, but you can put your arms around a father. And he says, not just any father. No, this father is in heaven and his name is set apart and hallowed. He's not just your run-of-the-mill father, this father. He is a perfect heavenly father. And this is the God who is waiting for you and me today to have our eyes open to see who he is so that we can know who he is and then know from him who we are. So how does this all work in our lives today? I want you to see a few things with me. If you're taking notes, I want to talk about it this way. Number one, how do we come into a relationship with the creator of the universe as father? How do we get in the position to pray a prayer, our father who art in heaven? How did that happen? And it happened because of the nature of the gospel. I want you to look with me in John chapter 1, and I love how in his gospel he talks about um, the infinite nature of Jesus as this chapter opens, but then he comes down to verse 12, and he talks about how we now are transformed in the story. I want you to see whether, whether you're joining us in Deer Lodge today, and God's working and doing a miracle in your life right now as you're in that service, or whether you're joining us in Portland to get today, or wherever across the fresh life family you are, I want you to understand that we're not talking about theology necessarily today. We're talking about a revolution today. We're not just talking about information. We're talking about a revival happening on the inside of you and the inside of me. And it happens by the nature of of the gospel. I think sometimes we've heard the gospel too much. We hear the gospel and people go, oh yeah, I've heard the gospel. Jesus gave his life on a cross because of my sins. He was dead and buried and raised from the dead on the third day, hallelujah, and ascended back to the right hand of God. I've heard that all my life. Listen, this is a revival message that transforms the heart and changes us from the inside out by the miraculous supernatural power of God. And it moves us into to a new position with God. And I'm telling you, nothing is better than what we're about to hear right now. Nothing in your life will ever top the reality that is already true of every one of us who's put our faith in Jesus Christ. So if you are in Christ by faith, you've already experienced the biggest miracle and the greatest miracle you're ever going to experience in your life. And it wasn't a one-time thing. It's an everyday thing. It wasn't a one-time decision. It's an everyday decision that we wake up with a mind blown and a heart blown of the nature of the gospel. And what is the nature of the gospel? It is not that Jesus died to get you to heaven. That is not the nature of the gospel. The nature of the gospel is that Jesus died and was raised from the dead to get you to your heavenly father to get you to the God that you've been looking for your whole life, the God that you've been searching for your entire life, that you could see him as he is and come to know him as he is so that you can come to know who you are as he sees you. 
Look at this text with me, John chapter 1 in verse 12. It says this, it says, yet to all who received him, now the him there is Jesus. So I'm going to just put him in so that we're not dealing with pronouns. To all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right. Somebody's got to amen this somewhere across one of these uh, services today. He gave the right to become children of God. Hello? You're like, oh, okay, is that, what, is that what the book's all about? Wow, can't wait to get my hands on this guy. Man, we, we are, you know, children of God. Incredible, Louis. Thanks for writing that. I really appreciate the effort that you put in to getting that message out. But man, we live from underneath and from behind so much of our lives feeling disadvantaged, feeling like we don't have enough, that we aren't enough, that we can't be enough. When we are, by the miracle of the, of the gospel, children of the creator of the universe. This is what has happened to us when we put our faith in Jesus. It goes on to say, we're children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will. Not putting it all on the guys, but maybe there was that one night. But born... <laughs> of God. This is the nature of the gospel. The second thing I want you to see is why this is so powerful. Why is this nature of the gospel message that causes us to be born again, to become the children of God, so powerful for you and me? Why is it more powerful than just believing in something or joining something or ascribing to something? Today's not about that. If you're new to Fresh Life, today's not about just simply saying, oh, I believe in all this and I'm joining all of this and I'm showing up for all of this. No, this is about something far greater than that. This is about having a brand new relationship with God by birth. You're like, how, how can that happen? I'm already old and I've been born one time. We're talking about being born of the Spirit, born all over again as sons and daughters of the Almighty God. And why that's great news and why that's so powerful is because every one of us longs for a Father's blessing in our lives. I don't know what your background was, and so my story may not relate to your story, but I remember, for me, uh, some of the summer days when my dad would show up at the pool. We didn't have a pool in our backyard. We grew up in an apartment complex. We were sort of lower middle class family, but we did have the, the, the laundromat for our apartment complex where we went and did our laundry. This is my family growing up, and then we had the little pool beside it, which was not that cool in real life, but it's pretty awesome when you were four years old. Or when we went to the one week of vacation we did every Every year to Florida and there we went to this little efficiency motel thing and they had a pool in the middle and dad would go play golf with the men in the morning all the kids would be in the pool and then all the men would come back from the golf course like two o'clock and it would be like dad dad come get in the pool mom was amazing moms we just want to give you a shout out we love you little footnote to moms we're here because of mom. We're dressed because of mom. We're fed because of mom. We've been taken care of because of mom. But when dad showed up, things changed. And it was always dad, 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 daddy, daddy, daddy. And when dad would get there, what do we say? Daddy, watch me. Daddy, watch me. Now, are you watching me, daddy? Watch me. I'm about to do my, my new jump, daddy. Are you ready? I'm going to do my backwards jump. Are you ready, dad? Are you watching dad? Okay, I'm going to do my backwards jump. Dad, dad, no. And then dad's talking to mom, trying to catch up because he just got there. And you're like, no, 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 no. No talking to mom. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Are you watching me? I'm going to do my pickle. I'm going to do my cannonball. I'm going to do my whatever I can do. Are you ready? I mean, we're this tall. We jump in. We do the thing. We don't care that we didn't drown. All we care about when we come up is one thing. What is it? Did you see it? Did you see it? Daddy, did you see it? And what do we want to hear? We want to hear, way to go, Ace. That's what my dad called me. Great job. We know our, our dads, you know, somehow intrinsically, we know our dads don't mean it. They're like, oh, wow, that was, that was incredible. <laughs> like, what happened to our kid, you know? <laughs> no, he thought it was incredible. 
But he's like, way to go, baby girl. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And that happens all through life at the dance recital, at the piano recital, at the soccer game, at the tennis match. When mom's there, that's, that's the stable factor in most of our lives, not everyone in, in the gatherings. But when dad showed up, I wonder if there's anybody in any of these services and there was that moment where you just kept looking around the curtain or waiting for the headlights to turn into the soccer complex, just hoping, waiting that your dad was going to show up for that moment. And either having the joy that he did and the double joy that he did and said, way to go, or that ache that he didn't for whatever reason he couldn't make it again. See, the power of the nature of the gospel is that it meets us at this deep need that's in every single one of us to have our Father's blessing in our lives. What is that blessing? It's his affection. To hear him say, I love you. To not just, oh, you know that I love you. Everybody knows I love you. I don't need to say it. And we're like, no, you need to say it. I need to hear it. I need to know that I have your affection. I have your approval. I have your attention. I have your participation. And I have your belief in me. And if you get it, and some of you got it, and if you got it, we're past Father's Day, but you ought to text your dad right now. I mean, right this minute, and just all over again say, thank you for giving me the blessing. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for speaking up and giving me a stone to stand on as I began the process of becoming everything God wanted me to be. But if that blessing wasn't there, there's a gap. And as much as we don't want there to be a gap, as we've sworn that we don't care about the gap, that we're fine with the gap or without the gap, that that doesn't matter to us, that we've moved on, that we are past that, that we are our own person now, that we don't care what our dad said or didn't say or where he, where he was or where he wasn't and doesn't matter to us anymore, that's not important to us, that gap remains in our lives. When I was writing Not Forsaken, I found an article in Psychology Today magazine, and the psychologist who was doing this study studied 75 high-achieving women at the pinnacle of their careers, of family, job, and all their endeavors. And, and she said, I was surprised that all of the women, all of them, these women are crushing it. They're crushing their jobs. They're crushing their, their, their dreams. They're crushing it in their marriages, in their families. She said, I was surprised that all 75 still viewed their success and accomplishments through the lens of what their father thought. Isn't that amazing? That longing for the blessing stays with us all of our lives. But here's the third thing. The power of this new relationship with God also is faced with a problem. And the problem is, for a lot of us, our earthly dad. I say to people over the last few years and decades, God wants you to know him as a perfect father. God's revealing himself as a perfect father. And more than a few dozen times, somebody shot right back to me, hey, if God's like my dad, I'm not interested. And I said, that's exactly the beauty of this message. God is not like your earthly father. He's not the reflection of your earthly father. He's the perfection of your earthly father. He's everything you ever dreamed your earthly father would be and so much more. And that's the beauty of where we are in this message. Because if God wants us to know him as a father, what's the enemy going to do? He's going to put a bullseye on fatherhood. He's going to destroy fatherhood. And none of us need a message on that this weekend. No one needs someone to stand up and go, man, the enemy's really after fatherhood. We all see the fallout of a fatherless generation. One in four kids in America are living in a home without the father present in the home. What does that mean? It means the blessing, the affection, the approval, the belief, the involvement isn't in the house every day. And we see the results of that 
all across our culture in a multitude of ways. And the reason why it's happening is because the enemy is trying to destroy the very heart of the relationship that God is inviting you into today. And for some of you, he's done it through breaking down your relationship with your earthly father. Not putting all the blame on earthly fathers, but just understanding that if you had an absent father or an abusive father, we talk about these six fathers in the book, the performance-based father. Oh, I'll give you the blessing, all right, if you earn it. We talked about the passive father, the antagonistic father. We celebrate the empowering father in the book. But if your earthly father's story is cracked, then you've had a gap and a hurdle to overcome in your relationship with God. And you may have come to know God. You might like God. You might like church. But moving into an intimate place with God, a place where you genuinely trust and believe that he's got you, that's been a struggle for you. And God wants to overcome that today by this fourth thing. And this is the hope. This is the radical nature of the finished work of the gospel reality. And I want you to see it in Romans chapter 8. I love this text. It says, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And when, when the text says sons of God, we're not leaving out the ladies, thank you very much. You're talking really about children of God. And then look how this plays out. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Now that word is really the spirit of adoption. So you received the spirit where you're taken in and received by spiritual birth as the children of God. That's the spirit that you receive when you put your faith in Jesus. Not a spirit that makes you fearful again, but a spirit that makes you adopted and understanding and aware of the new relationship that you have with God. And look what this says. It's so powerful. And by him, that means the spirit is a him, not an it. By him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is the word you would have heard in Jesus' day. A little kid in Nazareth would have seen his dad coming in from the shepherd's field or coming in from work, and he would have run down the street and said, Abba, 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 Abba. Not the same exact word as daddy, but an intimate word, inviting us into the intimacy that a child has with a loving father. So the Spirit of God comes into our heart and says, Abba, Father, Abba, Abba, the Almighty is my Abba, the Infinite is my Abba, the Sovereign God is my Abba, the Creator of the universe is my Abba, the Divine (laughs) Almighty Powerful One is my Abba, the True King is my Abba, the Righteous Judge is my Abba. How do you know you're saved? People ask this all the time. How do I know the prayer took? Or how do I know that I meant it when I prayed it? Or how do I know that I really was forgiven? How do I know I'm really saved? You know you're really saved when the Spirit of God awakens your spirit and your spirit says, I have a Father in heaven. I belong to the Almighty God. That's how you know that you're saved. He explains it a little bit more in a beautiful way. He says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. And now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. See, fear has a stranglehold on our generation. And at the heart of it, for a lot of us, is this massive question, am I good enough? I think you could even shorten it, am I enough? Because I wasn't enough for dad to stick around. Apparently, I wasn't enough for my parents to stay together. Apparently, I wasn't enough for my dad to sober up. So, so am I going to make it as a husband? Am I going to make it as a mother? Are we going to make it as a couple? I don't know if I want to get into this marriage thing because I don't know if I've got what it takes to do the marriage thing. I don't know if I want to step up into this challenge because I don't know if I've got what it takes to step up into the challenge. I don't know if I am enough. And that fear is paralyzing a generation, and all of it's not due to fathers, but a bunch of it is. Yeah. 
And that fatherlessness has left an aimless and an off-balance generation that isn't quite sure if they can do it. Or the flip side is saying, no, you watch me do it. I am going to do it. I want to prove him wrong. I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to show everybody that I'm better than they said I was. And my dad said, I'll never amount to anything. You watch me. And I'm telling you right now, there's a guy on Wall Street crushing it in the seven figures. But in his heart, he is still restless because he's fighting against a blessing he never received. And the money he's put in the bank can't make up the difference. And God is standing in the story today and he's saying, hey, I know things on earth may not be put back together again, but you can have a new relationship with me. This message is called, I like to give the titles at the end in case they change during the message. (laughs) I don't understand these preachers are like, my message is title X. I'm like, boy, you're stuck with that right now. (laughs) So I like to wade in a little while, see how it works out and then put a title on it. And the title of this message is the tale of two trees. Now all of us have a family tree. Now yours might take a little extra piece of paper or two. Or maybe yours is real simple. Yeah, it was just, I'm an only child. It's mom, dad. They've been married for 20 years. And it's mom, dad, and me. Only child, grandma and grandpa Johnson and grandma and grandpa Lewis. And there we all are. Got some aunts and uncles, but hey, let's forget about them right now. Pretty simple. (laughs) Some of you are like, I need more time. (laughs) Hello, anybody need more time? (laughs) You're like, now, now that... The, the ex-wives, are they still in the family tree or is that like an, an alternate tree? Is that a separate diagram with a dotted line? My dad's new friend or grandpa's friend who seems like she's been at Christmas seven years now. Is she like in the tree, kind of in the tree? My stepbrother, my half-sister, my... It's complicated, right? And some of our family trees look Fantastic. And some of them, the bark's all flaking off and the leaves are kind of withering up. And it's definitely not the kind of tree you'd put a big swing in or build a fort in. But here's the thing, there's another tree in your story. And this other tree is called Calvary's tree. And on that tree, God gave his son for you. And I want you to see something that you may have never seen before. And his last words when he died for you. I mean, do you believe Jesus was innocent when he went to that cross, but he took on your sin? And his last words, before his final breath of, it is finished, you know what his last statement was? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A heavenly father and Jesus, God the Son, A relationship that had never been fractured for eternity. And now for you, that relationship is severed. And at the most desperate moment of his life, the father walked out on Jesus and left him to die alone for you. And Jesus used that word forsaken. Jesus was forsaken for your sin to close the gap between heaven and earth so that you could be forgiven and you could know for the rest of your life that you are born again into a brand new relationship with a perfect father who will never leave you or and never forsake you. You're like, how do I know God won't walk out of me? My dad walked out of me because he already walked out on his son for you. That's how you know he will never walk out on you. How do I know he will always be there? Because he turned his back on his own son so that he could promise you that through the payment of his son, he would never turn his back on you. God is for you and not against you. Not just a bigger version of your dad, the perfect version of your dad. A new tree is in your story. You've got a family tree in your story, but you've got Calvary's tree in your story today. And the beauty of Calvary's tree is that you're in a new family tree. 
You're in a new family tree. You know, there's a big preoccupation right now with the DNA tests, right? Technology in $99, you spit in a thing, you mail it off, and they send you an email link back to all of your ancestry and uh, the percentage of you that came from wherever it came from on planet Earth. It's amazing. <laughs> 23 and me will tell you everything you need to know about where you came from. And apparently this generation really wants to know who they are and where they came from. But here's a new reality for you and me. It's not 23 in me anymore. It's just three in me. Born again, new family tree, father, son, and spirit, and me. <laughs> yeah, mom may have prayed you in. Pastor may have helped you on the journey. Friend, family member may have been there along the way, but they're not in your new family tree other than being siblings, brothers and sisters in Christ. The new family tree is, it is a perfect father, the son Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. They gave life and birth life in you. So you are a daughter now of the three, the three in one God. It's Holy Spirit, Son of God, Father God, and me. Three in me. I am born again to a new family tree. Maybe your family tree is nice. Maybe your family tree is all janky, but you got a new family tree. Because of Calvary, you're in a new, this new family tree, and the Spirit of God is wanting to constantly say to you, you are a child of God. You're no longer a slave to abuse. That, that label is real, but it doesn't define you. You are no longer a slave to divorce. Maybe there was a divorce, but it does not define you. You're no longer a slave to a dad who is too busy for you or just disinterested or emotionally unavailable. Or a father like my father, I found out at the end of his life, who never got the blessing of his father. So my father tells me when he's in his 60s, a few years from dying, he's in the middle of this uh, disability through this brain virus he's had, and he's had a second brain surgery. We're sitting in a hospital, and my dad and I've never had common ground around Jesus, but I'm telling him on this day, God loves you, and he wants to forgive you, and he's for you, dad. And my dad looks right at me, and he says, son, nobody ever loved me, and nobody ever wanted me. And I'm pretty sure God doesn't want me either. And I'd heard the stories growing up that my dad, his parents split up. He lived with his grandmother. He lived with an aunt. He was passed around from one family to the other. Went to all three high schools in his city because he was moving around, staying with different relatives the whole time. But his dad, Louis Giglio the i I'm the third, he died when I was a year old. I never knew him, never met him. Didn't know anything about his relationship with my dad. My dad never talked about it, never talked about what their relationship was like. But here it is toward the end of the day. And he's telling me, I'll tell you what it was like. No one wanted me. That's what it was like. And no one cared about me. That's what it was like. No one loved me. And I don't think God loves me either. And I'm like, this is the power of the enemy to distort my dad going through his whole life thinking, my earthly dad, I know how he was. And that's exactly how God is toward me. And I sat there arrested in that moment, tears welling up in my eyes. I could not get any words in my mouth. I'm just looking at my dad and I'm like, what in the world is happening? But I'll tell you one powerful thing that happened. And I want you to see the revolutionary power of this message for you today, that you can walk out of this service today with a brand new view of who you are, that you are not forsaken. You are chosen. You are prized. You are fought for and bought. You have been sought after by Almighty God every moment of your life. And even when you didn't believe in him and couldn't see him, he believed in you and he could see you. And you may be in church this week and saying, I still don't believe in God, but you need to know this, God believes in you. And you can walk out of this service today with a brand new view of God and a brand new view of you. 
not some distant being, not some angry man in the sky, not some Alexa that we call on when we're in a I No, a powerful, almighty, holy God who's inviting you to come to know him as a daughter or a son. But something else can happen. And that is that you can become the revolutionary agent in your family. I sat in that room that day and for the first time sitting at Piedmont Hospital in my 30s, I saw my dad for the first time, not as a father, but I saw him as a son. A son who never received a father's blessing. And I couldn't get words, and there really wasn't much to say in that moment. I mean, I, you just can't come back with, oh, dad, or, I mean, it was real, and the pain was real, and I could feel it in him. But I sat in that room, and I thought, man, every day my dad is alive, I'm going to bless him, because I'm in another tree. I got a family tree, Martha Jean and Louie and all the Giglios, but I'm in another family tree because of Calvary. And I have a father who loves me. I've got a Niagara Falls, a blessing coming down on me every single day of my life. I've got a spirit who's awakening me to know who I am. And I've got a son who is living his powerful life in and through me. I've got what I need in my new family tree. And I commit, I'm going to send the blessing of my new family tree back up my earthly family tree. And I'm going to send up to my dad the love and the grace and the mercy and the blessing that he never got from his family tree. And I didn't have a lot to forgive my dad for, but some of you do. And maybe you've thought to yourself, there's one thing I'll never do, and that is I will never forgive my dad for what he did for me. But Calvary's tree changes all of that. And we realize if my father forgave me, then I, in turn, have the power to forgive. Not to sweep things under the rug. Not to let people off the hook. Just to trust them into the hands of God and say, you know what, I'm going to let you and God work that out, Dad. I choose to forgive. You know why? Because I'm a revolutionary gospel agent. I'm a born-again son. I'm a born-again daughter of the King of Kings. I've been set free from the curse of the past, and I am standing now in the blessing of the future. I've got resurrection power in my life. I have the ability to be everything God has called me to be. I can't be defined by circumstance. I can't be defined by situation. I can't be defined by what has been done to me or what wasn't done to me. I I am God's child. I am God's daughter. I am alive and I am powerful by the Spirit of God. And I have everything I need in the tree that I am now in. And I can be an agent of the revolutionary power of the gospel to the people in my life. Do you believe that today? No prison cell can stop the power of the resurrection of Jesus. No broken relationship can stop the power of the resurrection of Jesus. We are not pinballs in a life circumstance that we have no control over. We are sons of God and daughters of the King, and we are raised up to brand new life. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus that you would open our eyes to see you as you are. Father, I pray that there would become a clearer picture of you in all of our minds today, that you're not just what we concoct in our minds, but you are who you reveal yourself to be. And I thank you that through Jesus, you have showed us that you are someone we can know intimately. Call on always and be connected to and related to for the rest of eternity. I pray that you would speak over men and women, single adults, young people in these services. You are prized. You were paid for. You have been bought. You are wanted. You are pursued.
And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would break every curse. And today in your powerful love, you would set us free. Father, I pray that the power of your spirit would stir in our hearts even now to do what no message can do, to convince us and to testify with our spirit, we are, I am a child of God. We believe it and we receive it in Jesus' name.